Hey, it's Pastor Mike here at Zion Lutheran Church in beautiful downtown Sandusky. It is July 30th on Tuesday. Uh, it also is my birthday today, so happy birthday to me. So uh, we'll be looking at the uh, first lesson for this upcoming Sunday and the epistle from Ephesians. So Exodus 16, 2 through 4 and 9 through 15 is what we'll be looking at. And um, this is, uh, well, let's talk about Exodus briefly. So Exodus is part of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, or the Torah, the law. Um, Pentateuch meaning five books, um, and the Torah meaning the law. So you have ex uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So those are the first five books often attributed to uh, Moses, and maybe some traditions go back to Moses, but I seriously doubt Moses wrote them because some of the places that are mentioned and timelines did not happen until after the fact. So uh, again, traditionally they were attributed to Moses, but I think as time has gone on, we have learned that uh, there have been multiple editors of the Old Testament throughout the uh, centuries. And uh, doesn't mean that a lot of this does not uh, relate back to it. As a matter of fact, Exodus is really, you know, without a doubt, let's say, uh, historical. I mean, there was an Exodus. Even though there is nothing written in Egypt about it, um, it is fairly well documented through the Hebrew scriptures and their traditions and oral traditions probably substantiate this pretty well. Um, the thing about Exodus is it's not just a history of the Exodus out of Egypt, but it is a theological explanation of the events of what had happened with the exodus from Egypt. Now, they're wandering around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. Uh, if you ever look at a map and see the, the wanderings, you'll say, gee, they were really wandering. Were they lost? Because uh, they, they needed to stop and ask for directions because it just looks like this winding thing, you know, that they were all over the place. And who knows why could have been roving bands of, you know, marauders or peoples that had occupied it or places that were dangerous to be. And, but they wandered around for 40 years. And again, the, 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 the theological is, is that uh, they, had to, they had to be in the wilderness wanderings for that long for the generation to pass away so the new generation will be able to uh, go to the promised land. And Moses never makes it to the promised land. He gets to see it. Um, but only uh, only Joshua, I believe, is the only one who gets into the promised land from the old group. But that's the idea that there's a theological reason for these things to happen, just like the text that we have today is uh, the giving of the manna and uh, and the quails that uh, this is a not only just a historical thing but it is um, an explanation of why and what the people are ex what's expected of the people manna means what is it <laughs> so which they didn't know what it was now there's been lots of speculation and some people say there was these insects that left this uh, excretion on the ground in the mornings that ate off of uh, tam tamarack trees, I think it was it was, and um, that was what um, manna was, because it was left on the ground, and you could only eat, you only got a day's worth when it was there, and because it would spoil, and so you couldn't save it. Although they do end up saving it in verses 33 and 34. They make a, an om, omar, an omar um, measure of, in a jar and put it in the Ark of the Covenant or near the Ark of the Covenant, something like that. 
but um, but again, that is theological too because it relates back to uh, the line in this particular passage in verse nine: "Draw near to the Lord." So trust. It is a they, they did the jar because it is a symbol of trusting the Lord that the Lord would provide for them each day, not that um, they could hoard it up or save it. Um, but it was something that the Lord would provide every day. Um, there's a, a line of thinking about miracles um, that says miracles cannot defy nature. Um, and so you have explanations from people like the, the manna being from insects or the quail being in a migratory state or... Um, the rock being, you know, part of when he strikes the rock with the staff and the limestone produces water because there was limestone under, there's water under the limestone in that area of the Sinai. So again, the, the, the thinking is, is you cannot defy the laws of nature. But I think, again, the idea is, is if you go, if you're concerned about the explanation of how these things can happen, um, you're missing the point of the reason why it happened. Um, they are actually put to the test here um, when they are told they can only have enough for that day. Um, and don't fail because it'll be spoiled. And with the quail, you know, they're, they're told uh, they complain they didn't have meat. And so the, the quail come, and I, I, I didn't look up the passage, but... There's a passage in Exodus that it says they ate so I think I believe it's Exodus that says they ate so much quail that it was coming out their noses. They were vomiting it up. So um, because they, they you know again oh we got meat and it's like we just eat it all and we ate so much of it and it made them sick because you know they couldn't trust they didn't trust they didn't take that time. The wilderness wanderings are all about education of the people uh, and trusting in God. Uh, like I said, it is truly wanderings around the Sinai. In um, pastoral terms, well, maybe not pastoral, but in in uh, ch- church circles, there's a, we call a lot of times people who don't want to change or want to go back to Egypt, the back to Egypt bunch. Um, cause we can go back to Egypt and have onions, right? We don't have any onions out here. All we got is this manna and this quail. Yuck. I'm tired of it. We can go back and have some seasonings and in, in our stew and whatever. And we call them the back to Egypt bunch and the back to Egypt bunch raises its ugly head ne- several times throughout the travelings of the wilderness wanderings. And the idea again is, is, you got to have faith and you got to move forward in life you can't go back you know it's just it, you know why why trade in your freedom for uh, servitude just because you get you know seasoning on your food <laughs> but um the whole idea around exodus again like i said is that it is not just a history of what happened, but it is a theological explanation of why it happened uh, and how God led the people and how the people needed to learn to trust God. So let's read Exodus 16, 2 through 4, and 9 through 15. The whole congregation of Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Of course, nobody ever complains in churches, do they? (laughs) So the Israelites said to them, uh, If only we had died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. (laughs) I'd rather be dead. (laughs) Really? Um, And when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So you brought us out of Egypt to kill us. So that's that's nice, right? Um, 
I always just get a kick out of the this complaining, you know, that just uh, amazes me sometimes. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they follow my instructions or not. And, and uh, Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of Israelites, draw near to the Lord. Trust the Lord, is what it's saying. For he has heard your complaining, and Aaron spoke to the whole congregation. Remember, Aaron speaking for Moses, because Moses doesn't speak well. He stutters and his grammar, and he, he, we think he had a lisp or something. But, you know, so Aaron becomes the mouthpiece for, for Moses um, in many situations. And Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, and they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the, and the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to the, you know, he's calling them the Israelites. You know, it's not my people, so he's not really happy with them. It's like when your mother or father call you, you know, by your full name. He say to them, at twilight, uh, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord. In the evening the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? <laughs> it's manna. What is it? Man What's manna? What is it? That's what it is. For the Lord has given you, um, for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. So trust and believe and keep moving forward. But it, 40, it takes them 40 years. And generally it's their children who come in after them who actually get to see the promised land. So, second reading is from, or the epistles from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Um, he's, the writer of Ephesians has been going on about unity, and that theme continues. Um, we had Greeks and Jews unifying, and we had family unifying, and now we have um, the body, the church unifying. Um, there are several things it talks about in here. It says, therefore I, a prisoner, which would refer to um, Paul's imprisonment, although we don't think this was Paul, but um, Paul did write a lot of his letters from prison so they would understand what that meant. And he says, a prisoner in the Lord. So, or um, Paul would often say a prisoner in Christ Jesus, but this says Lord or Curio, Curios. Um, in Greek, um, beg you to lead, lead meaning to walk or conduct yourself uh, with the calling you've been called, the whole idea of calling, that we're each called, the body of Christ, each member of the body is called to serve a purpose. Um, you have one Lord, one baptism. You have a reference to Psalm 68, verse 18, when he ascended on high and made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. Uh, it talks about uh, when he descended into the lower parts of the earth or death or burial, um, which was oftentimes referred to as Sheol in the Old Testament. And Sheol was just an abode of the dead. Remember, they did not believe the Old Testament was not believing in an afterlife. It's only really a hundred or you know a hundred years before Christ before they started to believe um, in uh, a resurrection or um, a life after death. Um, refer, we're referred to as children that we need to grow up, stop following fads and new things that you need to have a stable worship life and he continues to talk about the body's growth and building up itself in love in terms of um, I want you to think about this in terms of body parts or body let's do body systems now the church is the body of Christ 
right? We can all agree on that. So the body of Christ is a body. So what systems does the body have? Well, you have the nervous system. What correlates to nervous system in uh, the uh, the church or the body of Christ? What is the, what is it that um, feels? You know, is it, it what? Where is the compassion? Where where is the outreach? Where, where is it the inreach? I mean. Um, the skeletal structure, like what is the skeletal structure? Is is that like the property committee that you know we have to we have a building, but it's not just a building, but it translates into <coughs> what we do with the building in the community. Are we a community center? The muscular system. <clears throat> what is that? Is that worship? Is that? Um, Fellowship is it? What 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 system within the church is the muscular system? Uh, circulatory. What what pumps the blood in our in in our church? What gets our blood moving? Worship, um, Bible study, prayer. I mean, all of those things in terms of uh, circulatory, respiratory. What gives us breath? You know, the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the pneuma. In the Greek, the Hagias Numa, the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach in Hebrew that talks about the spirit that moved over the waters. What gives us breath in the church? What are those things? Digestive system. What do we need? Bible study. You know, we need to be fed. We need this, the music. We need, you know, encouragement. We need shepherding, those sorts of things. Um, Immune system, what keeps our immune system healthy? What is it in the church that causes that, you know, that braces us, that we are stable in our in our body of, of the church, that we don't get some disease and run off and uh, have a problem? Um, and then, of course, my favorite one, the excretory system. What gets, what, what do we do in the church to get rid of the bad things? Things that aren't good for us, you know, to, to keep into the body. We don't want to keep them in the body. So just think of it in terms of systems. Think about, as we're reading this, what systems correlate to systems within the church. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Let's see. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worth, worthy of the calling you which you have been called. Again, the body of Christ. We are all called to be parts and members of the body of Christ. With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another in love. Just certain conduct that needs to be there to have peace. Making every effort to uh, maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Again, this has been his theme for the last several uh, chapters is unity, unity within the church now. Uh, for there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive, and he gave gifts to his people. So we are these body systems that, that make the body healthy. And we have to maintain the systems within the church just as we have to maintain the systems in our body to, um, to be healthy. And again, this is, the, this is, I think, the message here is, for in Ephesians is you, we we not only want people to be healthy and to live healthy lives, but we want the church, the body of Christ, to be healthy too. So what does it take to do that? And part of that, and a major part of that, is unity. When it says he ascended, what does it mean that he had also descended to the lower parts of the earth? If you remember in Peter, um, is it Second Peter, First Peter. He descended to the dead to free the captives. Um, so he can even save people who have passed before us. So God can even reach into into hell and into the afterlife and save people. 
He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts that he gave were some would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. There we go. Systems, parts of the body, things that we do to make us healthy. We need these things. We need prophets, apostles, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. There we go. See, systems, body systems, systems within the church and within Jesus Christ. Until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of full stature in Christ. So, it's again, you don't really grow in faith, but you do grow. You do grow. You learn more. You become um, whole. You become healthy and mature. We must no longer be children, immature, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine and people's trickery, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. So we need to be alert to these things. Sometimes something new isn't all that good. Sometimes something old isn't all that good either. So we just need to be healthy and we need the whole body to be functioning so that we can look at these new things and these old things and say, what do we want to keep? What's going to keep us healthy? Um, By people's trickery, trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. Um, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way in him who is the head, the head, the brain, right? So what would be the brain system? <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, uh, from whom the whole body join and knit together by every ligament which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth in building it up itself in love. And I like the idea of systems. You know, Paul will often talk about if the hand or the foot or the eye um, but if you think about it in terms of the systems of the body, I think that makes it even more healthy and more understandable. Um, you know, if the foot can't say to the eye, you know, I don't need you, or the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. We need each other in terms of body parts. And body systems are what keep us healthy and what keep us alive. Those are the things we need to do. So, with all this talk, about one body and one bread, (laughs) the manna. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless, and we
scattered and thrown, gathered to one for all. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless. We the many. that probably a little too fast but devotion was running a little long today so gracious lord be with us and create a unity among us help us to be a healthy body of christ at zion lutheran church and for the whole world that they be healthy and through your son jesus christ we pray all right that's it for today i will see you on thursday i had a dream last night that I preached a sermon and it was so long that I had to cut out everything but the communion itself and I'm thinking boy I don't think they would like that <laughs> so anyway um, I will see you on Thursday uh, take care peace <laughs>